Okay, so for this project, our Pollution Mapping Citizen Science Project, the way that it works is we have teams of volunteers who adopt a sampling site along the Indian River Lagoon. And that team of volunteers goes out every quarter and samples the same site on the Indian River Lagoon. They collect field samples, they take stuff back to the lab and perform lab analysis. And this happens every quarter. And these are all of the same tests and collections that the scientists at ORCA also do. So we currently have about 90 citizen scientists who work on this project. And since we sample quarterly, we've so far completed three of our quarters for 2023. So we have our February, May, and August samplings done, and we still have sampling coming up in November. And so these hours that we have here are cumulative hours so far for those three quarters in this year. So our 90 citizen scientists have um, donated and volunteered for over 810 field hours and over 1,000 lab hours cumulatively in those three quarters. This project has grown a lot. It started in February 2020 with only three sampling sites. And now in August 2023, we have 28 sampling sites so far, and I will tell you about our newest sampling sites, but we are continuing to grow um, every year. And we now cover four counties with these sampling sites. And those sites are all measured four times a year. Our newest sites are up by Titusville. So these are uh, Kennedy Point Park down on the bottom and Sand Point Park on the top. So we chose these in collaboration with Ideas for Us, who are our volunteers at these sites. We chose these uh, due to their proximity to Kennedy Space Center, as well as some recent ecological events that have occurred there. They've had several fish killed and algae blooms in the past couple of years. So these are our northernmost sites at this point. So we're really excited to keep expanding our spatial extent. So in our pollution mapping citizen science project, we take a lot of different measurements. So the uh, analyses that are highlighted in red are things that we're going to talk more about in this talk, but I'm just gonna take you through really quick all of the different things that we do. So we take your basic water quality measurements, temperature, salinity, pH, which tells you how acidic it is, uh, dissolved oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, and we look at the water depth and muck depth at a site every quarter. In our sediment, we do a measure called relative toxicity where we use a bioluminescent bacteria to test as a proxy for how relatively toxic that site is compared to other sites. And this can give us kind of a um, idea of what sites are doing better or worse than others. Um, within the sediment, we're also looking for DNA, specifically for four different antibacterial resistance genes. And we conduct particle analysis. So we look at the different sizes of particles in the sediment so we can see if it's more sandy or more mucky and what that might mean for some of our other measures. We, right now, look at herbicides like glyphosate, which is the major chemical component found in Roundup. And we look at nutrient analysis in the pore water, which includes ammonia, nitrate, and phosphate. 
And we have an annual analysis where we send out sediments to a contract laboratory to look at several heavy metals, total organic carbon, and total sulfur. And we've just, uh, this in 20, the end of 2022, started looking at PFOS, also known as forever chemicals. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, in the water column, we're looking at alkalinity. We are looking at acetaminophen and sucralose, which are markers for human waste and can help us distinguish between septic and sewer systems in an area. We perform the same nutrient analyses, so ammonia, nitrate, and phosphate. We also look at herbicides in the water column, and we've started looking at PFAS um, in the water column as well. So Veronica is going to zoom in a little more detailed on some of our nutrient analyses. Yeah, so with the data gathered by our citizen scientists, we'll, we're able to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Right now, we're looking at water called nutrients. And as some of you may know, um, there's many sources of nutrients. And although some, ex some levels are expected in the environment, an unbalanced amount can lead to negative effects like harmful algal blooms, um, which can lead to seagrass decline, and it can also affect um, our, the human health and also the health of our organisms. So what you're seeing here is water column nutrient concentrations for August of 2023, which was our most uh, recent sampling period. On your y-axis, you have the concentration, and then on your x-axis, you have our sites. Um, this in includes our most recent sites down here, Sandpoint Park, Kennedy Point Park. It's also divided by uh, county. And then on your blue bars, you have your phosphate concentrations. Your orange is your nitrate nitrite, and then your gray is your ammonia. So when I take a step back and I'm looking at this, one thing that stands out is the water column phosphate concentrations in comparison to the other nutrients. So if we were just to focus on water column phosphate at that time, this is what that graph would look like. Again, on your y-axis, you have your concentration, and then on your x-axis, you have your sites from north to south. But this time, we're comparing our water column phosphate concentrations to reference values. These reference values were provided by the DP. They actually conducted a extensive study on different bodies of waters throughout Florida to determine these values. So the 50th percentile, which is that orange line, is at 0 0.04 milligrams per liter while the 90th percentile is at 0 0.16 uh, milligrams per liter. So when we're comparing our pollution mapping sites um, for August of 2023 for these um, reference values, um, 27 out of our 28 sites fall on or above the 50th percentile, while 26 out of our 28 sites fall on or above the 90th percentile. So 90% of those sites that were included in that study done by the DP, their concentrations fall below the concentration of our 26 sites, um, with the exception of um, the IR25 Spoil Island and Faber Cove, which actually they did not see any um, phosphate in their water column. Um, but just keep in mind, this is a snapshot of August of 2023. We've been monitoring these sites throughout the year so we were curious as to see how the levels might be changing throughout the year. So this is what that looks like. And this is a box plot graph, which is a visual tool scientists use to better interpret data. It basically tells us the distribution of our values. So again, on your y-axis, you have concentration. And each box here corresponds to the cycling period that we collected the water column phosphate um, for this year. And I really want you guys to focus on this X value right here, that X. Um, that's just telling you the average concentration for that period. So if we were looking at these averages, it visually seems like there's been increasing since February to May to August. Um, and when we did our statistical analysis, it showed 
that August of 2023 was significantly higher than February of 2023 and May. So if we were to reference that previous bar graph that I showed you, the concentrations of phosphate that we were seeing for August were relatively high for that year, um, which just emphasizes the importance of longitudinal monitoring because that it really allows us to understand what's happening in the environment and how our nutrients may be uh, fluctuating and not just at a snapshot in time, but throughout time. Um, another analyte that we monitor throughout time is glyphosate. Glyphosate is the number one ingredient in Roundup. It's an herbicide used to kill weeds. And it's actually heavily used in the United States and globally. And although it is heavily used, there is a lot of debate in the literature on its health effects. For example, the EPA summary review of glyphosate as of now states that there's no risk to aquatic biota or mammals, while the World Health Organization says it's probably carcinogenic to humans. Um, and there's also debate in the literature on its half-life. Some sources say that once this is introduced to the environment, it stays there for two days, while others say that it might linger there for over 200 days. So although there's a lot of debate in the literature on its health effects and its half-life, one thing that we're certain that we can say is that we're seeing it in our waters, we're seeing it in our sediments, and we're seeing it in our fish fillet. And this is data that we've gathered through our citizen science projects, which is why it's so important that we monitor glyphosate. And we have been monitoring actually glyphosate since November of 2021 in the water column. So what you're seeing here is water column glyphosate concentrations for all of our sites from November of 2021 to our most recent sampling in August of 2023. So each line here corresponds to a site. Um, and we there's no legend because we want you guys to just focus on the overall trend for all of our sites, not specific sites. Um, some lines may look like they're cut off. That just means that that site was added at that specific time and we don't have previous data. And the left y-axis, which is concentration, corresponds to those solid lines, while the right y-axis corresponds to those dotted lines. And the reason why we did that is these dotted lines had such high concentration compared to those solid lines that if we were to put them in the same y-axis, it would make those solid lines look flat or almost zero. So this is just a better visual re representation of what's happening for all of our sites um, throughout the years. So when we're looking at this, one thing that stands out is this drastic increase from February to May of last year, right here. And when we presented our findings to date, um, six months ago, we actually didn't have um, data for glyphosate for May or August of this year. So we were curious as to what we were going to see this year compared to last year during this time frame, February to May. And if we focus on this year, visually, it doesn't really seem like there was much increase. But when we did our statistical analysis, it showed that there was a significant increase both last year and this year from February to May. So what you're seeing here is our p-values. These are statistical values we use in order to determine if something is significant or not. So p-values less than 0 0.05 are considered significant. So you can see here from February to May, there was a significant increase last year and also this year for water column glyphosate um, concentrations. Another thing that we found uh, very interesting is this year we're seeing a significant increase from May to August. One we didn't see last year, although our August concentrations were similar for both years. Um, so it seems like last year we saw a more drastic increase from February to May, while this year we're seeing more of a gradual increase in water column glyphosate from February to May 
uh, to August. Um, so one re one of the speculations we have as to why we might be seeing this increase occurring in February for both years, from February to May for both years, is we believe that people may be applying herbicides, in this case specifically herbicides with glyphosate, before the wet season begins as a way to prevent weeds from popping up. Um, actually, if you search what is uh, when is recommended to apply herbicides in Florida during the year, it actually says late spring, early summer, which falls in those months. So we're not quite sure why last year we saw such a drastic increase from February to May, um, although both last year and this year, we are seeing an increase, significant increase from February to May. It's just this year, it seems more, more gradual, which again, emphasizes the importance of longitudinal monitoring. Our Indian River Lagoon is a complex system that's continuously changing, as you can see here in this graph. And what you guys are seeing, this data is actually new data that nobody has seen before. ORCA is one of the few, if not the only organization collecting this type of data. Um, so the more information we have, the better we are able to understand what's happening in our environment and how we may be affecting it. So it's so crucial that we continue to monitor these sites and um, continue to monitor glyphosate um, to see how it might be changing throughout time. Um, and with that said, I'm going to pass it along to Dr. Kleiman. She is going to be talking to you guys about um, forever chemicals and pups, so. Hi, I'm just trying to change the slide. There we go. Okay, so one of the things that we just started monitoring last year and we'll be continuing to start monitor, be continuing to monitor going forward is PFOS, <clears throat> and that stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. So a lot of people just call them forever chemicals because that's a lot easier to say. They're called forever chemicals because they're persistent in the environment, so they stick around for a long time, and they come from a wide variety of sources. They can come from different manufacturing processes. They can come from dry cleaning chemicals, nonstick coating, uh, firefighting foam, landfills. There's a lot of different sources of these chemicals and they're being found in the Indian River Lagoon already. Other people have found them in the Indian River Lagoon water, sediments, even manatees and alligators here. Um, so we want to try and measure these at our sites and kind of set a baseline for where our sites are in comparison to some of these other places and how that might be changing over time or if there might be new inputs in the area etc. So we want to add this to our suite of different parameters that we measure. So some of the concerns with PFOS are there can be health effects from these and there's been shown correlations with PFOS and human health effects. And because there's so many different types of these compounds, it's hard to really narrow down a specific health effect to tell you because they all have slightly different ones. Um, but it's been associated with kidney disease, liver disease, um, different types of cancer, um, a whole suite of different health effects depending on the PFAS that you're encountering. And as I said, the reason this is so difficult is that there's over 9,000 of these compounds. And when we start getting concerned about some, and like in Europe, some of them have become banned in certain manufacturing processes and things like that, but then they can develop new PFAS um, and new compounds that are then those specific ones aren't regulated, even though the other one was. 
So because there's so many and they're so specific, it's really hard to regulate these. And currently, uh, there's no current federal mandate in the U.S. on PFAS concentrations in drinking water or food. The EPA has proposed regulations for PFAS specifically in drinking water, um, but only for six of those over 9,000 compounds. So two of them that are most common, they are um, suggesting that they're limited to four parts per trillion each for drinking water concentrations, but they're only looking at those six compounds and we're seeing a lot more than that. So in this graph on the y-axis on the left is our, are our different sites. And these aren't ordered north to south like Veronica's slide. These are ordered from lowest concentration to highest concentration. On the x-axis, we have um, the sum of PFAS concentration in the water column. And this is in parts per trillion, so it's a really small amount, but this is the sum of all of the different PFAS that we looked at. So as I mentioned, the EPA is looking at six different compounds for drinking water regulations. In this analysis run by our collaborators at UF, we tested for over 90 different PFAS compounds. And we found PFAS in all of our water and sediment samples. But the important thing to remember is PFAS are already everywhere. They're in manatees, they're in alligators. We're trying to establish baselines and see which of our sites are more affected and maybe in a um, detrimental range. So these sites are uh, sorted by color for the county that they're from. So red is Martin County, purple is St. Lucie County, blue is Indian River County, and green is Brevard County. And these are from November 2022, so we don't have all of the same sites present that we have um, in our current sampling. And uh, our highest site here for PFAS in the water column is Shepherd's Park, um, which I'll come back to in a minute. So when we look at our PFAS and sediments, it's organized the same way. So our sites on the y-axis, but because it's being sorted from lowest concentration to highest concentration, these sites aren't in the same order as they were on the previous slide. Um, but again, we have the county denoted by color and concentration in parts per trillion on the x-axis. So in the large majority of our sites, we saw much higher concentrations in sediment. And this has to do with the residency of PFAS um, and how these different matrix matrices work. So in water, water is more variable, it's constantly moving. So you're getting more of a snapshot of PFAS at that exact second in that precise water that's in that area at that time. Whereas if you're looking at sediments at a site, that's more sequestered. It's going to show you more of what's happening on a longer time period and what's happening there um, overall more so compared to looking at the water column. And while some of these sites look quite high, these are all of our concentration ranges that we're seeing both in the water column and in sediment are comparable to ranges of PFAS found in these same matrices um, in other places in Florida. And I just want to point out again that we have our top 
sites here for PFAS and sediment are Poppleton Creek and Shepherd Park. So some of our next steps um, with this project in general are we've already started a study utilizing our PUPS or passive underwater pollution samplers in Martin County. So our PUPS are samplers that we deploy in the water. They sit out there for a week and cumulatively bind to whatever parameter we're looking for. So this is going to show us a time averaged concentration of that parameter um, rather than just a grab sample, like a water sediment sample. And so we already have pups that measure different nutrients and we're in the process of developing our methodology for copper pups, which will allow us to start measuring copper as well with these samplers. And so the site, the study that we've started is deploying these nutrient pups up Fraser Creek near Shepherd Park and up Poppleton Creek. And so we've already done one deployment and collection of our nutrient and copper pups and we'll complete another in the spring. But something that we're looking forward to is we have a collaborator at UF who we're going to start working with to develop pups for PFOS as well. So with these pups, we can put several of them up this stream and hopefully uh, let us localize those hot spots of that particular pollutant. So we'll be able to see as we go up the stream where there's higher PFAS compared to other places in the stream. So we're looking forward to that. This is a picture of Veronica while we were deploying the pups. And because we had to canoe up the streams, we were towing all of our equipment in this little raft behind us. Um, so it's pretty exciting to add all of these new measurements. And we're really excited about this project and where it's going. And we really want to thank all of our funders who make it possible. Because we're a nonprofit, we don't have funds to do this without these people. And we really appreciate it so much. And several of these places also help us as volunteers. So we're very thankful for the funding. And we're also so thankful to all of our volunteers who we could not do the extent spatially of all of the sampling and all of the man hours in the field and in the lab. And we really enjoy working with everyone. And we couldn't have this project still be growing and becoming as big as it is without all of them. A few references for some of our facts that we had, and we can take any questions. 